my presentation is going to be in the main conceptual. That is, I am going to consider what the concept of raga and what is the concept of creativity and how the two can go together. And then specifically in the, in the context of khayal, what can we possibly mean by creativity, given the concepts of raga and um, creativity in general. So it's, it's an exploration of the um, conceptually as it were. So I'm going to make a fundamental, um, I'm going to try and show that creativity in the context of raga, talk of creativity in the context of raga poses a fundamental problem because of what raga is. Raga is grounded in a grammar, in a framework of rules. If creativity is creation of something new and valuable and exemplary, that is one of the uh, uh, one of the favorite definitions of creativity, that it is, it's a creation of new, not just something that is new, but it's also valuable in the tradition. Um, now this sort of thing, is it, this kind of creativity of something new, is it valued in khayal or in raga music in general? Khayal is seen as providing great scope for creativity. Dr. Ashok Ranade has suggested that it might be a mistake to equate improvisation with creativity. We have a lot of it. improvisation, of course, but is that creativity? If it is, in what sense is it creativity? Variation is an aspect of most music and also raga music. Khayal offers immense possibilities for such variation, especially by engaging actively with the tal. And Pandit Deshpande demonstrated it so brilliantly earlier today. But as for radical creativity, in the sense of creating something new within a raga, I suggest that instead of looking for novelty in the music itself, we might turn our attention towards how it is experienced. A phenomenological approach, if I may so say. And I will look for some ideas from Alankara Shastra here. My uh, thesis was on Alankara Shastra. So. Now, Khayal, what is Khayal? Khayal is presentation of Raga, that's what Alankara it is. Alankara Shastra in literature. Alankara Shastra. Alankara Shastra is concerned with literature, theatre. Yeah. yeah, literature. But there are general ideas of uh, beauty and of uh, which can be applied to music, not all of it, but some of it are, is quite applicable. So khayal is essentially presentation of a raga. That's what it is. So the first question is, what is raga? How do we talk of it? What does the idea of raga entail or involve? Now every raga, as I said, is, in, is associated with a framework of rules, with a grammar. It can only take certain some syntax and some, uh, uh, some vocabulary. We have only some swaras, some notes admitted in each raga and certain ways of combining them, uh, giving emphasis to some notes, not de-emphasize some notes, everything. There is a host of uh, subtle uh, nuances to every raga, which are essentially absorbed. Uh, they are not written down. They can't be written. You can't exhaustively list the grammar of a raga, for instance. Um, it is absorbed in practice by listening, in practice by learning from a guru and so on. Um, so Joe Bohr, for instance, he, he has defined. So how do you define raga? Raga is often defined as a framework of rules. Um, Bohr has defined it as a tone and framework for composition and improvisation. And others, uh, mostly Western scholars, and that is the reality that uh, we do refer a lot to Western writers on Indian music because that, there's a certain kind of approach there that uh, appeals to some of us, especially those educated in the universities. And there may be some problem there. Um, so if you talk of raga as a tonal framework, it's a framework of rules. Is that how a practitioner of music thinks of a raga? When I think of Yaman, do I think of the rules? Um, we don't. We, we think of the raga swarupa, that is important for us. 
to the framework of rules is of course there. It can never, uh, we can't deny it. But that's not the fundamental way of being of a raga, of how the community of practitioners experiences raga, thinks about raga. It is a swarupa, it has a form, which might manifest itself, which might manifest itself if you stick to the grammar. It is not necessary. With the, with the very first phrase, the raga might manifest itself, or it might not, after much plodding about, even if you are grammatically correct, the raga will not manifest itself. So, these um, aspects of uh, how raga is, uh, uh, how raga is perceived, thought of in the tradition, we have to, I think, keep in mind. Um, what is Raga Swarupa? I will come to that a little later. I have some suggestions. Um, so Raga is also definitely associated with grammar. It's undeniable. But the primary way we experience Raga is not as a framework of rules. So now um, a few aspects of Raga that problematize talk of creativity is that if indeed there is a uh, set of rules that governs performance of a raga. What kind of creativity can we expect? What kind of creativity is possible or indeed desirable? Do we want normal phrases in a raga? Is it possible? If every raga demands adherence to lakshana, raga lakshana as it is called, grammatical rules, subtle rules of inflection, of ornamentation, phrasal rules, etc., then the possibility or indeed the desirability of creativity, creativity is questionable. And it is held by many in the tradition. Traditional performers, my own guru for instance, uh, Karnatic uh, ace violinist, he says, creativity, improvisation and all is humbug. It's not that anything new is created. Now, the other issue is that one learns, trains, and this is true of any music. One learns, one trains, one practices, one puts in those 10,000 hours. Um, how does this impact creativity? Do we come up with something uh, new, really? There is a, a the, the behaviorist view, for instance, would say that everything is explicable in terms of your genetic makeup and what you have been exposed to environmentally. You may not be exactly able to trace every little thing to something that you have been exposed to, but the position is that it, in, in, in essence, it is possible. So, um, Vides, for instance, says, a number of studies have suggested that improvisation in Indian classical music is less spontaneous than it appears to be and is almost always reliant on extensive memorized materials and procedures. And he has quoted those studies, I did not look at them, but I want to say that even within the tradition, creativity as such is not explicitly given prime importance. Other parameters of form, proportion, we say it has to be well formed, the, the phrases have to be well formed, in Carnatic music especially, the pudi has to be well formed, delivered well. So also in Hindustani music. Raga chaya are seen as more important than creativity. The artist's creativity in the sense of going to new places is not always seen as a critical parameter for assessing her music. If the creativity is all over the place without uh, considerations of um, form, proportion, raga lakshana, you're just using the notes of the swara and that happens. <coughs> We have this myth of Narada Muni. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. For those who are not familiar, I'll just recount this myth. And myths are uh, uh, important. Uh, they capture important ideas of the community. So Narada Muni is very proud of his musical prowess and he has been belting ragas and raginis for some time. And then, in, and he is a Triloka Sanchari. He, he moves across the world, he travels, trying to foment trouble here and there, and then he comes across these strange looking creatures. They are distorted, and they are lying on the ground, writhing in pain. So he asks them, well, who are you and what, why are you like this? What happened to you? 
So they say that we are ragas and raginis. You know, there is this uh, Sanharada Muni, he has been singing, he has been singing us, so to say, without uh, respect for our form, the Raga Swarupa. And we are reduced to this state. So Narada Muni is stricken with guilt and he asks, well, I am the guilty person, so how, what can I do to restore you? And they say, we have to be performed properly. Only if you are performed properly can we be restored. And who is the person to do it? Lord Shiva. And Shiva, we must remember, is an ascetic. He's a tapasvi. Um, so that kind of uh, a mental makeup, kind of restraint, is what is required to handle the material, the raga material. So this Narada Muni myth is reenacted in our times every now and then. In Carnatic music, for instance, we have an, been an amazingly gifted musician uh, who is very imaginative, but the kind of musical output that he gives uh, leaves many of us quite exhausted and dismayed because Raga Swarupa is a casualty. So what I'm trying to say is when we speak of creativity, in Hindustani music again, uh, Pandit Deshpande was referring to Patiala Gharana this morning. Some contemporary performers of Patiala Gharana would probably, you know, uh, be our Narada Munis today. Um, so, this is probably why creativity is underplayed in the tradition. Now, always uh, helpful, even necessary to look at our own languages to see how we talk of it. In uh, Hindustani music, we talk of Pratibha. Creativity, we talk of the word we use is pratibha. In, in Carnatic music, we use the word manodharma. Though manodharma is also used for the improvisational aspects also. So, alap, naravel, etc. are also called a manodharma. The faculty of the musician is also called manodharma. Anyway, the point is, speaking of khayal, I'm, I, I really want to put this question to you. How many musicians of this, that is top ranking musicians, very visible musicians, how many musicians of this age or the past age do we speak of having pratibha? That is the question. So, do we, most other musicians, many other top ranking musicians, uh, are, they offer us sound music, good music, creativity, plays a subservient role. An artist might on the other hand offer fairly predictable music with little spark. But if it's sound on principles of form and content, we do value it. And I think, I believe many of the top ranking musicians are of this kind. The competent musicians are still acceptable, I would say. Whereas the musician who lets his imagination run unbridled is not. The greatest musicians, however, manage both creativity and adherence to expectations of tradition and they inevitably push boundaries. So I have tried to problematize or even draw your attention to the fact, uh, to the importance that creativity as such is given in the tradition itself. And I suggest that explicitly no guru tells him to be creative, no, figure out a new phrase there. No, we don't do that. Variation is there to which I'll come. So 2.30 already. So now what is creativity? I'm quoting Al, uh, Albert Rothenberg. Creativity is not synonymous with originality, productivity, spontaneity, good problem solving or craftsmanship, although the term is often used interchangeably with these. Creations are products that are both new and valuable. Creativity is a capacity or state that brings forth such creations. A painter may be original, Maybe original, but uncreative. So uh, the Narada Munis are very original, but we do, this is not the kind of creativity that we value. A literary scholar may be productive, even prolific, but notably uncreative. A spontaneous person may produce conventional poems spontaneously. Computers as well as scientists provide good but uncreative solutions to problems. The skilled craftsman might replicate great works of art, but never be able to create one of his own. 
So creativity is the creation of something that is new and is seen as valuable, something that is exemplary in the sense of being worthy of an example that people will follow. Immanuel Kant has said that the genius, genius sets rules for art. He gives the rules for art. Now what is the sort, what is the place of this sort of creativity in khayal that is new and valuable, exemplary or even other raga music. We talk of improvisation in the context of khayal, also Carnatic music, Madhrupad and this is generally regarded the ground for creativity. When one sings alap or bolband, that is creative, is the general opinion. Dr. Ashok Ranade has suggested that while we do speak of improvisation in the context of raga music, it is not quite creativity. I quote, the role of improvisation in Indian music has been both misinterpreted and exaggerated, chiefly because improvisation has been unnecessarily and rather prematurely equated with creativity. A historical reason for overemphasis of this role has been the operations of 19th century nationalism, which followed apparently contradictory strategies of glorifying the non-Occidental, that is, we are creative, we have great improvisation, and also trying to emulate the Occidental. The century busily extolled improvisation, but repeatedly tried to evolve comprehensive notation systems, etc., to create the definitive and the written alap following the Western vogue. When we present a khayal, what is it that we actually do? What are the various aspects to it? First of all, there is sur and laya. Sur sambhalna padta hai, laya ko bhi sambhalna padta hai. Both are, um, both should be internal workings, inner workings. Now, the tanpura is an external reference, of course, the tabla gives you the laya. But it has to be, it has to stem from something inside. It, is, it has to be an inner alignment, an inner absorption. And I'll come later on to my suggestion that that is when creativity, in the sense it is valued, in the tradition is possible. They are also engaging with the raga and tala. We work with the composition, bandish. Aspects of Badhat or Vistar, we have Ala, Bulpan, Bultan, Taan, etc., the works. We engage constantly with the tradition. Ragaswarupa, the Tala Vartan, Mukhra, Sam, etc., Gharana stylistics. We are not deliberately trying to be creative. That is not something we are, you know, thinking about and doing in terms of figuring out new phrases. We seek variation, of course, as I said. Variation is all the time happening. We don't, for instance, want to repeat the same phrase around the Madhyam of Kedar. We seek different ways of coming to Madhyam. That is there. That is variation. Or if we sing the first line of the Bandesh again and again, each time there are small and big variations. But variation is like tinkering. Is there more to creativity than variation? Can we talk of something more in the context of raga music than this kind of variation that is that's there? Of course, some musicians are more brilliant at variation, like we heard Pandit Desh Pandey today, he was simply brilliant. And some people are more labored at variation. That is there. But do we seek to uh, be creative in, in an in a in, in a more sense. A jazz performer, on the other hand, is under great pressure to do something different each time he plays. To be creative in the sense of coming up with something different. The melodic uh, movements, this how he negotiates the chord changes. He has, he's under pressure to do something different. I don't believe we are under the same kind of pressure. The demands of Sur Laya Raga and Tala are more dominant. The cognitive aspect of the Raga is central to us. A well-known common phrase 
delivered with sensitivity and absorption, captures the Raga Swarupa more than an acrobatic display, original swara, original movements maybe, an acrobatic display of virtuosity aimed at dazzling audiences. Now that, a phrase which evokes the Raga Swarupa, that is of greater value to us. Now what is Raga Swarupa? I have what, 10 more minutes? Okay. Um, so I'm going to suggest, and I, I've been talking about Raga Swarupa as if it's the most uh, normal thing and the most something that I can talk about like that. Um, the, the reason why we talk of Raga in terms of framework of rules is because it's easier to talk of it like that. When we say Raga Swarupa, it's some ghostly thing. But um, I think an important aspect of what we mean by Raga Swarupa is that the, we are able to perceive, when you sing a phrase and you f perceive that yes, it is Kedar, or you perceive that it is Des and not Tilak Kamut, you know, that sort of thing, that cognition, you are able to perceive the Raga, that is the manifestation of the Raga Swarupa. So essentially I believe there is the element of like a cognition involved there. The listener also seeks to expand his knowledge of the cognitive aspect. So knowledgeable listeners are accorded great respect in our tradition. This communication of the cognitive aspect of the Raga bears similarities with use of language. Parallels between language and music, language and Raga have been explored by many. Uh, but in, um, uh, in collaboration with another uh, interested scholar, semi-scholar like me, one Vidya Jairam, and I, we have presented an, um, these parallels in terms of um, drawing ideas from Indian knowledge traditions, Indian, uh, Indian um, um, discussions of language, issues of language in Sanskrit traditions. It's relevant here because when we speak of the process of Kayal presentation, or a Karnatic Raga Alapana, this is something that has to be taken care of at all times. The Raga Swarupa, the cognition of the Raga, whatever you may do, the Raga Swarupa has to be there. And we look at it and, when, uh, and it's very easy to destroy it. Not for seasoned musicians, but when you're setting out, for the rookie, it, is, it happens all the time. Now, we have called it Raga Bodha. Because uh, uh, knowledge that is con conveyed by language is called Shabda Bodha, so we have called it Raga Bodha. A musical performance of a Raga is primarily judged for its capacity. <coughs> Fundamentally, this has to be there to give a clear picture of the Raga. Phrases must be well formed and not ambiguous between Ragas. If you hear something and you're wondering, is it Meg or is it Matmatsarang? or is it Tilakka Mood or this, then it is not good. It's not a good performance. Cognition arises, so that's what I said, so we have called this Raga Bodha. And one of the fundamental things that we have argued is that it is phrases and not notes that are primary units of this Raga Bodha. And we have drawn parallels from Parallels with the Sporta theory of the Vayakarana. So I won't go into that, just that for this, whatever I'm going to say, it's the phrases that I'll be talking about. And another useful concept that developed in this tradition and which I think can be applied to understand Raga is the concept of Akanksha. Akanksha is translated as expectancy or to give an uh, give the stock example in these tradition, the Sanskrit traditions is gam aneya, bring the cow. So the word gam is not just uh, is not just cow, but cow as a in the accusative position. That cow is an object. Gam aneya, bring the cow. So if you say gam, and then something else, maybe palam, you know, uh, both cow in the accusative sense and fruit in the accusative sense it cannot convey Shabda Bodha. So a fundamental condition for Shabda Bodha or for cognition through language to occur is 
that each word completes the other each pada I should not say word pada each pada should complete the other so gam as such has an akanksha and expectancy for a a kriya pada for a, a verb um now in music in raga if you sing a phrase of yaman that phrase seeks completion with another or two or three other phrases and that alone kind of gives a complete picture of the raga swarupa what happens in the case of one possibility of creativity and you know in the raga of course if you sing a phrase the ni there are any number of there's a lot large number of phrases that can follow it and complete the raga swarupa and give you a, a proper cognition of yaman but there are at least some phrases which if you sing after the ni it will leave you bewildered raga bodha will not happen now one way that creativity can happen in raga music is and this happens with uh, our most creative musicians that they forge links between such unlikely combinations so so that is uh, that's one way that uh, akanksha can be used to try and understand how creativity is possible um and there is another kind of akanksha and this is what we may call cognitive expectancy the structural expectancy when you go to a concert there are any number of expectations right you expect that the, the singers musicians come dressed in a certain way and you expect some things but uh when the presentation unfolds generally given the certain tradition whatever it is it's carnatic or khayal or dhrupad you have a certain expectancy of how the concert is going to unfold so all that comes into structural expectancy so in uh, khayal for instance we have generally expectation of ashtanga right you sing the bandesh vilambit and then you have alap bol etc the build up of the raga now this is something that has been questioned by pandit kumar gandharva and uh, others also and in carnatic music also um the the general paddhati of presentation um has also um, i i i have heard of tr subramaniam starting a concert with a tillana which is quite quite unheard of how the concert unfolds so these are all part of expectancies of course um, tm krishna was here earlier he he is constantly questioning this uh, way of unfolding the concert um but within the performance itself if i get the the ordering and all that but within the performance itself how the alap is structured for instance alapana in carnatic music is structured there are some some expectancies and uh, if the artist can creatively thwart those expectancies and do something different that is another way we value creativity and in khayal of course the most and that is actually what would be under variation in khayal the most uh, uh, what should i say the, the most um, fertile ground for such variation is how you build the avartan take the mukha and show the sam that is that is in find it where, I, where variation is possible there and there you're all the time playing with expectancy with akanksha you expect that the musician will weave his way to the mukhada and pick it up and show the sum and how he surprises you and how he uh, does it in very creative ways that is that is part of the excitement of khayal but here um so to sum up uh, i think i have spoken of expectancy and creativity in raga there are two ways one is the cognitive expectancy the other is structural expectancy akanksha the expectancy that is particularly exciting in the case of khayal is the build up avartan build up 
taking the mukhda and showing the sum. Now I'm going to play and uh, see here creativity uh, or variation. Creativity itself, there are we can talk of it of, as uh, two kinds. There is rule governed creativity. That is what most variation is like that. So you sing um, an alap, you sing a bandesh, and then some alap, take the mukhda and show the sum. This is all rule governed. There may be it may be different, maybe varied ways of doing it, but we are all we are, we are bound by the rule of by the rules of the raga of the tala of the words, um, some gharana stylistics, etc. So this is rule governed creativity. Now we are interested in rule forming creativity, something that is different, that is creative, uh, and it goes just beyond these rules challenging them a little and yet the raga swarupa is not destroyed that sort of creativity is uh, what i am uh, focused on here so i'm going to play two clips without meaning any disrespect to the artist one is uh, pandit kumar gandharva and the other is shrimati ashwini bhede both are singing the same composition in miya malhar bolare papi hara um I would uh, seriously like a discussion on this aspect of expectancy and how these two clips, you know, how they impact us because of the expectancies that are generated among, in us and how it is resolved or not, or some surprise resolution is affected. And I, I'm sorry, this is only possible for people who are knowledgeable who uh, know what is happening. So I'll first play Kumar Gandharva, Pandit Kumar Gandharva. Responses from here. Um, if there was anything, you know, I'm just the tans, you know, brilliant as expected. Once you know Kumarji's uh, style, even that becomes expected. You know, though if whatever he sings, it is unexpectedly in surila and just on the dot. But for me. Um, Today, this uh, late earlier this morning, uh, Satyashilji Panditji was telling, talking about the Tivra Nishad, uh, the Shuddha Nishad in Mia Malhar, and how it is just used as a launching pad to just arrive at the Sa. Now, in this, he has stopped on Tivra Nishad, right? Sa, Nidhani, that Nidhani Sani, uh, the pitch is not, the Nidhani Sani without. Uh, uh, Nidhani, Nidhani, this is more 
comment. This is what we expect. Right? Where is he sung? Tivra Nishad, Dhevat and Tivra Nishad. Which is actually not rule governed. In the sense, it is not how Mia Malhar is normally sung. We, the, the, the descent to the Dhevata is from Komal Nishad. But he has descended from Tivra Nishad. Or we can just say Ni Dhani. It may sound, you can say that it is an ascent from Dhar to Ni. I mean, these are all hair splitting things. But my point is, the more uh, common thing to do is uh, Komal Nishad, Dhevat, and Shuddha Nishad. He has done it. Shuddha Nishad, Dhevat, Shuddha Nishad. And the most important thing for me is there is no Raga Bhanga. It sounds just as Mia Malhar as anything else. And the other thing that I found extremely ahlada uh, janaka for me was when he stops on knee and then he takes the mukhara at the pancham. Right? Whereas I would, I was expecting that he will go to the sa. You hold the knee for so long, the normal expectation, the akanksha, is that you go and hit the sa. He just didn't do that and he just came to the pancham, which in the hands of a lesser musician would have sounded terrible. But he does it without any loss to Raga Bhanga, uh, to, the, to the Raga. Now that is actually mystifying how it happens and how this has happened and I don't have answers to that. But this is a kind of, you know, creativity that um, is possible in Raga music. Now the other clip that I'm going to play is Srimati Ashwini Bire. She is singing the same bandish. very different way of uh, uh, generating Akanksha but it was strictly rule governed. There was no uh, going out of the Raga, raga rules as such. And uh, she was using the words of the Sahitya in a more romantic way. Bholari, Bholari, that sort of thing. Which is also, you know, part of uh, Khayal rendition. So, um, So to kind of, uh, I'm winding up here. Um, I, I've suggested that while there are basic conceptual issues surrounding possibility and desirability of creativity in raga music, the fact is that we have had and continue to have brilliant musicians who are also seen, uh, who are also uh, there. Although like any good thing, they are rare. Um, variation is found extensively in Khayal performances. The quality of such variation is, of course, different. Uh, generating and resolving expectancies 
first of the raga swarupa it's of the cognitive aspect of raga and the presentational aspects these i think form the core of creativity in uh, raga music mm. and then um, how about creation of a completely new phrase a new melodic movement in say yaman and i would suggest i would think what kumar ji did is slight is kind of new minutes at least of course pandit ji says it's the older version of miamal had they had this kind of uh, emphasis of nishad but nidhani that sort of phrase to me at least it's quite novel um but the question is apart from that particular instance in general can one not claim that uh, radical creativity is possible in khayal there is don't brilliant musicians come up with novel phrases or novel movements original movements in ragas which are also exemplary what i want to say is that first of all this is unverifiable to say that this particular phrase has never been sung before and he sang it in principle it's unverifiable there's no way of knowing that it has never been sung before ever and the more important thing for me is that it is not important it is not important for us whether that phrase is completely original what matters is not whether the phrase being produced is being produced for the first time ever but how it appears that it appears new and fresh it should not be like the musician is laboring and thinking okay now i have to sing this phrase or now i have to sing that phrase how it appears to us that is of crux in raga music the the alankarikas the alankara shastra tradition is a very rich tradition of um, speculation on um, literary excellence now they have uh, extensively talked about and debated about the aesthetic experience the experience of uh, literature of rasa is one of the very important concepts that they have um developed um but they have very little to say actually about creativity um but there is a story of the adi kavya which is interesting and kind of illuminating for us here see adi kavya is the first ever verse that is in the tradition it is believed that uh, valmiki valmiki was had just been told the story of rama by narada i think i don't know narada had just told him the story and he was thinking about it engrossed in the story and walking in the forest and he sees a pair of crouncher birds they are mating they are in love and he is just immersed in that uh, very beautiful sight the scene is so perfect and uh, suddenly from nowhere and a hunter shoots one of the birds and that it is that the happy union is is destroyed and valmiki utters what is called what is regarded in the tradition as the adi kavya ma nishada pratishtham tvamagam shashvati hi samah yat krauncha mithuna dekam avadhi hi kama mohitam this is regarded as the first ever verse poetic verse in the sanskrit tradition it is it is traditionally regarded as a first verse now what is so poetic about this that's the question why is it regarded as poetry because then there is an explanation itself that valmiki just steps back in astonishment at his own creation and he says kim idam vyakritam maya what is this that, that has come out of me what have i uh, what is it that i have said just now and he says shokah shlokatvam agatah so my pathos the the sorrow that i felt at the sight of the crouncher bird being killed has been transformed into this shloka now that is um regarded as in one school very 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 prominent school of alankara shastra they they regard that that is the best way of poetry that everything has to proceed from the emotion the rasa of the poet simply using some clever poetic devices some alliteration some endlessly long compound words or just description of some scene some maybe sunrise or sunset which has ring on the 
emotive content of the poem as such. That is uh, dismissed by the school of uh, Alankarakas. So, now in music, I want to say the same thing. Um, that here I'm not talking of rasa. I'm aware that Pandit Satyashin Ji is here. We won't, won't like talk. <laughs> no, but I'm not even talking of rasa here. I'm talking of raga. The raga, you are immersed in the ragas, uh, what you have experienced of the raga and how you think the raga should sound. And you're singing. That, that immersion itself brings out music that will sound fresh and new. And here again, I want to quote from the Alankarikas. They say, Drishtapurva api hyarthaha kavye rasapparigrahat sarve nava iva bhanti. Sarve nava iva bhanti madhumase iva drumaha. It is if, the, if it proceeds, even if it is a very commonplace description in the poem, in the kavya, in a mahakavya or whatever, even if it is a very commonplace description, if it is, it proceeds from the rasa, or it, it goes to nourish the rasa, rasa, sarve nava eva bhanti, that everything appears fresh. And the uh, metaphor here is just, I think, quite brilliant. They say madhuma se eva drumaha, like flowers in spring. Now spring brings flowers, a rose is a rose, a champaka is a champaka. It has the same form texture, color, etc. But every time it blooms, every flower appears fresh and lovely. So also, even a well-worn phrase of Yaman or Kedar or Miya Malhar, if it is presented in a certain uh, attitude or a certain uh, orientation of the mind, I would say, that is when it appears fresh and that is of value for us. Not some, you know, some original phrase. So the dhani rega of Yaman is the same, but can bring joy each time when delivered with that quality. Now what brings this quality? And here I'm a little, um, a, a part of the answer and an important part, is that it is a state of mind of the artist, of absorption, which is focused, yet it's free in a sense. Carl Rogers, for instance, talks of this as extensionality, which is the opposite of psychological defensiveness. When, to protect the organization of the self, certain experiences are prevented from coming into awareness, except in a distorted fashion. In a person who is open to experience, each stimulus is freely relayed without being distorted by any process of defensiveness. Instead of perceiving in predetermined categories like trees are green or modern art is silly or here I'm, this is my own or I, I think I must sing that Gandhar now or that Tan that I have practiced without thinking like this. The individual is aware of this existential moment as it is being alive to many experiences that follow outside the usual categories. It means lack of rigidity and permeability of boundaries in concepts, beliefs, perception and hypotheses. It means a tolerance for ambiguity, where ambiguity exists. The truth of performance of Raga is that there is a great deal of defensiveness, of anxiety, all of which prevents extensionality as Rogers calls it. The mind of the performer while engaging with the music is also observing and most often it is judging, so that each musical moment appears to the performer shrouded in this cloak of judgment. When the observing mind is quietened and one is able to engage with each moment in its stark being, that itself leads the musician on to the next musical moment and true creativity is possible, everything appears fresh. Elsewhere I have suggested that it's like the persona is split into two, like the two Upanishadic birds. I'm not giving an interpretation of the Upanishad, just using that allegory that the first one eats while the other one observes dispassionately as an observer. So also the musician performs. One part of the persona is performing 
and that demands deep involvement. The first bird enjoys the fruit, finds it delicious. But the musician is also a dispassionate observer, not letting ideas of self into the picture, not judging, not hurrying or conforming for the sake of conforming or questioning for the sake of questioning or being creative for the sake of being creative, but letting each musical moment lead her to the next one. Some musicians call this a state of sahaja. Thank you. Uh, it was uh, uh, quite uh, pertinent to whatever I had said about Mia Mallar, those two clips that you played, that Shuddha Nishad aspect. Now being too familiar with Kumarji and in his Sobat, I felt that Kumarji is going back to his impressions of Vazebua, who has given this 78 RPM. And Kumarji was very fond of his music, like Onkarnath Thakur. So I found it that novelty together with the uh, essence of parampara that he is carrying. Thank you.